Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvellous video. Facehuggers are those little creatures that come out of these giant eggs and attach themselves on unsuspecting hosts to ensure that an alien erupts out of the chest cavity of the host, obliterating it. The little chestburster goes on to become a spine-chilling xenomorph. But what's interesting is that facehuggers have scared horror fans as much as an adult xenomorph. Why is that? Is it just because they do something that was rather unimaginable previously? Of course, I'm talking about their ability to orally assault humans, even males, and get them pregnant. But there's much more to it than that. Facehuggers come loaded with a bunch of crazy anatomical marvels, which they use to detect, attack, and impregnate their host before. Yes, they die a simple death after their job is done, but what happens before that is truly terrifying. So. In this video, we'll explore the marvelous anatomy of facehuggers and explore all the factors that make them what they are. Let's begin, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Number 1. A brief history of the conception of facehuggers from O'Bannon to Giga to movies. The birth and conception of the facehuggers is a story as fascinating as the things they do, and it involved the creative minds of Dan O'Bannon and the legendary artist H.R. Giga. Dan O'Bannon, the architect behind Alien's story, had some ideas and a vision for how he wanted his facehuggers to look. He corresponded these ideas to H.R. Giga and asked him to design a creature with distinct characteristics. O'Bannon's concept involved an octopus-like creature with tentacles that would ensnare its victim's head upon leaping from a distance. Additionally, this creature was intended to possess an ovipositor capable of forcefully implanting its spawn down the victim's throat. Interpreting O'Bannon's instructions and the sketch drawn by O'Bannon, Giga inferred that the creature would emerge from a large, violently hatching egg. He probably even drew inspiration from Marvel Comics' The Eternals issue number 6, in which there was a mention of spidery fingers. So, instead of the tentacles initially proposed by O'Bannon, Giga gave his creature spider-like fingers. Giga also envisioned the creature needing plier-like appendages for prying open its victim's mouth. Giga's final design of the creature resembled a distorted, colossal phallus. So, that's the behind-the-scenes basis of why the facehuggers look like they do. Of course, the creatures later underwent some serious changes, but the overall anatomy remained the same. Number 2. What are facehuggers? Anatomy, physiology of facehuggers. Resembling a fusion of skeletal hands, the facehuggers also have a spine-like tail. The creature possesses eight elongated finger-like legs that help it remain fast and agile while helping in rapid crawling. And the tail helps these little bundles of menace leap over large distances. If you haven't noticed yet, this combination of appendages seems very similar to arthropods such as arachnids and horseshoe crabs. Interestingly, the ventral side of the facehugger features an orifice, which houses a long and powerful proboscis. This tubular extension is used to deliver a xenomorph embryo, and bears a stark resemblance to the anatomical structure of a human female's reproductive tract. The extended digits of the facehugger offer rapid mobility across various surfaces, and also help in firmly gripping a host's head during the implantation process. Despite their spindly appearance, these digits possess considerable strength and can even tear human skin when removal attempts are made. Once secured onto a host's head, removal becomes exceedingly challenging and a successful implantation becomes inevitable. The creature's tail also helps enhance the grip around a host's neck during implantation. Additionally, instances have been documented wherein facehuggers use their tails to constrict potential hosts. If you thought that was all, the facehugger's acidic blood further complicates any efforts to detach it. As far as their color is concerned, facehuggers predominantly exhibit a beige hue, which somewhat looks like human skin. Now, that's not all the similarities that facehuggers share with real-life animals. Positioned bilaterally along the creature's body, situated at the tail's base, are a pair of pouch-like structures that serve as bladders. These bladders play a crucial role in the circulation of air into the host's lungs during the implantation process. Adjacent to the underside of the facehugger is a small orifice, from which which a proboscis extends into the host's throat for the implantation. Notably, this proboscis measures approximately 50 to 60 centimeters in length. Prior to encountering a host, facehuggers remain inert and inactive within their overmorph. When proximity to a potential host is detected, the egg channels its remaining bioelectric potential that's actually held within its acidic blood into the facehugger. This transfer allows the facehugger to become active. Once liberated from the egg, 
facehuggers use a set of thermo auditory sensors like those used by adult xenomorphs, and this sensory framework enables them to track and approach their prey with vicious precision. Typically, facehuggers do not really pursue hosts and rely on the inquisitiveness or lack of awareness of the potential hosts before actually leaping at them. This strategic approach minimizes the victim's chances for escape, but if a host manages to avoid the first attempt, the facehuggers don't shy away from relentlessly chasing the fleeing hosts. Although rare, facehuggers have shown the ability to survive independently outside of the egg without immediate implantation for a duration of up to 120 hours or five days. But what if a host dies before the implantation can complete or even begin? Well, they just move on to the next living thing in the vicinity. Three, host interaction and its reproductive role. What's their lifespan? Upon detecting a potential host in its proximity, the facehugger does a lot of things to attach to and subdue its intended victim. Thanks to its leap with startling force and pinpoint accuracy, the facehugger quickly wraps its tail around the host's neck while simultaneously securing its digits around the skull. This powerful grip essentially leaves the host shocked and panicky, which helps in what the facehugger plans to do next. It then administers a cyanose-based paralytic chemical through simple skin contact, which is further facilitated by dimethyl sulfoxide, a compound widely known for its transdermal drug delivery potential. Studies conducted on facehugger victims have also revealed the presence of a neuromuscular toxin, which induces temporary unconsciousness. This sedative doesn't waste any time to become effective, incapacitating adult humans and even yaujas within mere seconds. Intriguingly, the facehuggers have the ability to correctly assess a potential host's body mass and composition. This information helps them in deciding the precise dosage of the toxic substances, and they administer these in just the correct quantity, no more, no less ensuring that the host doesn't die, but at the same time, their immune system gets suppressed. Although the facehugger's primary method of subduing a host is its chemical arsenal, it also exhibits the capacity to put its tail to good use for some good old asphyxiation. I mean, there could very well be instances when the standard chemical sedation process is just impossible or interrupted. In these troubling times, the facehugger changes its modus operandi and simply chokes you. This alternate method, albeit slower in bearing the desired results, is comparably potent. The tail's robustness has been likened to that of a boa constrictor and can even defy the strength of chimpanzees. Having said that, the facehugger doesn't always wait for you to become unconscious. Instances have been documented wherein hosts maintain consciousness throughout the implantation process, and that's nothing short of traumatic and torturous. And when a facehugger is forcibly kissing you and pushing its tubes down your esophagus, you know that you're in for some serious trouble, which is not strictly physical. During such times, the host experiences vivid, distressing dreams, potentially correlated with the facehugger. The inability to call for help also causes extreme panic and psychological disturbances. And I believe we know fairly well by now that the facehugger is not picky or judgmental when it comes to subduing a host. They've engaged with humans, predators, engineers, oxen, and even more obscure lifeforms like the indigenous rhino-like creatures from Ryushi, and other creatures resembling scorpions, snakes, and even gorillas. But when it comes to subduing hosts that are just too big for one facehugger, they resort to swarming it in a group to overpower it. So, that was all about subduing the host. But what about implantation? So, the process of implantation is just as complex as the subduction. Upon securing itself to the host, the facehugger uses its proboscis to penetrate the victim's throat. This proboscis serves a dual purpose. Firstly, it supplies the host with the appropriate respiratory atmosphere for sustenance while simultaneously initiating the implantation of the xenomorph embryo. In contrast to the subduction, which is rather quick, the implantation is a gradual process and can span several hours to ensure the precise and successful fusion of the embryonic xenomorph with the host's physiology. All xenomorphs are creatures that walk with an air of mystery around them. Likewise, there were various theories and hypotheses regarding the manner in which a facehugger impregnates the host. Initially, it was believed that the facehugger introduced an embryo into the host's esophagus, accompanied by a chemical mutagen triggering the formation of a placenta-like organ within the host. An alternative theory suggested that the facehugger implanted cellular clusters or tumors, compelling the host's body to independently construct the chestburster within its own tissues. However, the prevailing and currently accepted theory is that the facehugger's implantation process is more intricate than a mere transfer of embryonic material. Instead, the facehugger introduces a mutagenic substance known as Plagiaris prepotens into the host's esophagus. This mutagen acts as a positive catalyst for the restructuring of the host's cellular composition, inducing the host's body to autonomously assemble the chestburster from its own biological matter. You might ask why I've been using the term embryo all along, if that's not exactly what the facehugger administers to the host. Well, let's just say I did it for the sake of convenience and better understanding. Hmm. The implantation process is long, and the facehugger remains 
is attached to the host even after the process has been completed to ensure the secure integration of the chest burster. This period can vary from a mere 20 minutes to as long as 16 hours. Suppose you find someone who's actually under a facehugger attack. What do you do? Well, you can't really do much for this poor soul. The task of extricating a facehugger before the initiation of embryo implantation is nearly impossible and severely unsafe for the victim. Firstly, the grip is so strong that it may tear the facial skin of the host. And then there's the corrosive blood of the facehugger, which means that you can't even puncture or kill the facehugger without melting the host's flesh and bones. Moreover, the external body of the facehugger, shortly after it emerges from the ovomorph, hardens and develops a chitinous resilience which is much similar to the hard chitinous skin of the adult xenomorphs. This adaptation gives the facehugger heightened resilience against blunt force trauma and even bullets. The facehugger's first and foremost objective is to ensure that the host survives the process, which leads to the birth of a chest burster. But in case the facehugger realizes that it would be removed or killed, its primary objective becomes killing the host. In some instances, the facehugger will strangulate you using the tail, and in others, it'll cause instrumental internal damage using the proboscis, which is already inside your esophagus. Hmm. Number 4. How Facehuggers Impregnate Hosts But Also Keep Them Alive Alien Number 4 authored by Declan Shelby and Andrea Bracado, is set on the icy planet called LV-695 in the year 2195, where a family of researchers explores water sources for a shadowy Wayland yutani like corporate entity. Here, they encounter an all-white facehugger concealed within the snow, and it puts weight to what we've been speculating about certain aspects of facehugger impregnation and the process of oviposition. At the beginning of the story, readers find out that after a facehugger puts the embryo inside a victim, it uses special flaps on its body, called filtering sacs, to keep the person alive. These flaps work like a filter, making sure the victim can breathe and survive. This is important because the facehugger needs the victim to stay alive until the embryo is ready to come out. The facehugger is really focused on making sure that the xenomorph embryo survives. In fact, in some instances, a facehugger even provides a breathable atmosphere to a host in an environment that would be otherwise hostile. So, how does a facehugger manage to do this? Well, it breaks down molecular components from the surrounding environment, subsequently rearranging them into the requisite compounds to nourish the host's lungs. Number 5. Genetic Adaptability Could a facehugger target someone whose mouth is bigger than the span of its fingers? Firstly, I already mentioned how multiple facehuggers swarm on the target when it's too big for a single facehugger to overpower. Once that happens, it's just one facehugger that impregnates the host. You know, it's kind of like how humans reproduce. Even if two males have intercourse with a female, only one sperm will fertilize her egg. But what would happen if a facehugger gets practically eaten by a creature whose mouth is bigger than the facehugger itself? Well, in that case, there's a high possibility that the creature will get impregnated because the facehugger's contents have managed to penetrate the internal part of the host creature. So yeah, if a T-Rex happened to nibble on a facehugger, it'd ultimately lead to a T-Rex-based xenomorph. In fact, we actually have a non-canon T-Rex xenomorph in existence. Number 6. Do they have survival mechanisms? Well, yes, of course they do. The facehuggers come with almost the same kind of defensive and offensive mechanisms that an adult xenomorph has. For starters, they develop a chitinous layer of skin right after coming out of the ovomorphs. This provides them the desired level of protection. Secondly, their acidic blood makes it a risk to kill them by inflicting puncture wounds, slashing or severing them. Thirdly, facehuggers are extremely agile and quick, so even if you're taking a shot at them from a distance to save yourself from the acidic spraying, you're bound to miss more than you hit. Then there are various other facehugger variants, like the Royal Facehugger, which comes with a bladed tail and is fairly larger than a regular facehugger. In fact, we've made an entire video on the Royal Facehugger, its appearance in the movies, and its canonicity. Then we have the Praetorian Facehugger, which is also bigger than the typical facehugger. And finally, these creatures can live up to five days in just about any environment if they fail to impregnate a host. And five days is kind of a long duration to fulfill their life's purpose, which all starts with finding just one living being to facehug. Beyond a doubt, the facehuggers can scare the daylight out of the victims and those who encounter them. That's all from my end in this video. If you feel like you want to leave a suggestion, correction or request, please feel free to use the comment box. You know I'll be waiting to hear it.